Hello again, this is uh, Steve Pearson and uh, others at ICER. Um, thank you very much for tuning in to the second installment of our series of webinars on perspectives on cost effectiveness thresholds in the United States. I kind of feel like saying this is episode two, season one of Game of Thresholds or something like that. <laughs> so, um, uh, so some of you who will be hearing today will, did not get a chance to hear the first webinar yesterday. Um, where we kind of covered a broader uh, view, if you will, of the philosophical approaches um, to cost effectiveness thresholds. And it included um, many of the topics that we will now delve into in a little bit more detail as we go forward. Again, this is part of uh, a webinar series that we decided to, to generate um, to uh, leverage, I guess, our visiting fellows uh, program. Um, and they are Jens Gruger and uh, Carl Claxton. Uh, Chris McCabe, who is visiting at a distance, um, and Sean Sullivan. So today, we're going to talk more about willingness to pay uh, as a basis for thinking about cost effectiveness thresholds in the United States. We're going to talk about willingness to pay twice, today and in the next webinar on July 26th. Today, we were going to focus more on certain aspects of looking at willingness to pay, um, uh, linked in particular to ideas around the uh, thresholds set to some ratio of the per capita GDP um, or individual surveys around willingness to forego um, revenue uh, for more health, di you know, different approaches. And to guide us through this, we're going to have a lead presentation from Chris McCabe. Chris will introduce himself to you, uh, but many of you know him. He's at the Institute for Health Economics in Canada. Um, following Chris's presentation, we're going to have uh, brief responses from Jens Gruger from David Meltzer and from Lou Garrison. And I'll say, say it now, but at any point during the webinar, um, please feel free to send us a question through the bar, the toolbar, I guess, on the side of the webinar. Um, and we will get to those questions as time permits at the latter part of the webinar. So with that, let me hand it over uh, to Chris and thank him in advance for his presentation today. Chris? Thanks, Steve, uh, and, and thanks uh, to ISA for inviting me to engage in this process. Uh, I uh, listened to Jens' uh, presentation yesterday. I thought it was, uh, it, it was excellent. I'm, I'm feeling a little bit intimidated by having to follow such an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, as Steve says, I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, thresholds for that are specified from the uh, either as a multiple of GDP or derived from individual surveys of uh, willingness to pay. Um, going to take about probably only about 20 minutes to get through this material. Uh, I think the, uh, I want to uh, see some hopefully rich discussions for the group and, and, and the people on this webinar. So uh, moving on. So this. Uh, Diagram is from a, a recent report we did for the Patent and Medicines Price Review Board here in Canada, which is uh, uh, a unique body. I don't think any other health system or, or state has uh, a body like the PMPRB. Uh, they set the maximum price that could be charged for patent and medicines uh, in Canada uh, at the time of, uh, of, of launch. Uh, and they are uh, in some ways, like I said, thinking about how use of a, a cost effectiveness threshold uh, might help them uh, arrive at, uh, at setting a price. Uh, and the main point of this diagram is just to, to remind us all that uh, the money to, to pay from healthcare, for healthcare comes from the same source. It comes out of, uh, out of people's pockets, uh, out of households. It's individuals who bear the costs of healthcare, whether it's uh, the money is extracted through health insurance premiums or through taxation. And under both mechanisms, both sort of ways of organizing things, uh, we as individuals have mechanisms for expressing our contentment or otherwise with the, uh, uh, with the adequacy of the healthcare provided. Um, and, and healthcare, however the money is allocated to healthcare, that allocation impacts on spending and investment in other areas of the, of the economy, either through uh, household uh, spending or, or through, through government spending. So we're going to focus very much on the demand side threshold, this willingness to pay uh, uh, component in today's uh, 
webinar. Uh, and in the US, um, health insurance is frequently, not always by any means, but frequently is an employment benefit. And, and that makes it really um, an at best imperfect expression of an individual's uh, value of health and healthcare. Uh, Often, you know, the, the, the employer's consideration of, of the value of making that investment uh, may be as much influenced by uh, the value of the, the productivity costs or productivity savings uh, from their employees that it gives them as anything to do with the consumption value of health for the individual. Um, further to that, uh, looking at the health insurance market to give us insight into the value of health, uh, is further made problematic because of uh, its treatment within the tax system. So uh, the health insurance uh, receives uh, tax credits, uh, which means that which they impact on, on, on disposable income and they impact on the public funds available for other activities. And they're really quite interesting, and this was some of one of the take home messages I, I, I took from Uwe Reinhardt's book, uh, was actually, because of the nature of those tax credits, how they work, they promote uh, inequality in access to healthcare. So they, they benefit the wealthy more than, than those less well off. Um, and, and therefore we, we, we have in the tax credits, we have a, a normative position, which is clearly not consistent with the idea of all people's health is, is, is equally valued. Uh, and in that, they, uh, th this has the effect of uh, uh, promoting uh, greater access to healthcare services for the wealthier, who are usually those who need it least. Uh, in the UK, we refer to this as the inverse care law. Those of us who are least in need of healthcare are, are most able to access to it. And that seems to be something that's probably uh, plays out in the US as well. Um, well so what we see uh, in the in the private insurance health insurance market in the US is, I would say, weakly related to uh, the value of health and we, you know, a, a really quite uh, confounded source of information about uh, the normative question of what healthcare should be covered. Uh, in line with expressing the preferences of uh, American citizens. So just looking at what healthcare is paid for uh, uh, and how much is paid for it, it's probably not a, a, a very useful or, or, or rich strategy to uh, identify a, a willingness to pay for health uh, in the US uh, context. Um, but we do need this value, we need this threshold. Um, it's uh, you can't in, interpret an isolate as, as saying something is good or poor value without a threshold. You know, saying that something has a uh, $250,000 per quality as an ISA doesn't tell you whether that's good or bad value without this reference point of a willingness to pay or a cost effectiveness threshold. And, and, and so decision makers reach for uh, indices, reference points to allow them to, to convert uh, essentially an inf a piece of information about the, re the, the balance of costs and benefits of the technology into uh, a decision of we should or we should not pay for this. And so um, the thresholds that are out there uh, are widely used. Uh, I, long before who came up with their thresholds, we had the, 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 uh, the $50,000 per quality threshold, which no one could quite nail down where it came from, uh, but certainly didn't have an empirical base. Uh, in the early years of this century, the Hugh Cho Choice uh, program put forward uh, these proposals. That, uh, uh, a technology that had a, an ISA that was less than one times the capita GDP should be deemed to be very cost effective. Between one and three should be cost effective and greater than three should be deemed not cost effective. And I, I've just uh, uh, put up uh, the implied US threshold on, based on US 2017 uh, per capita GDP data. Uh, and I don't think anyone argues that uh, if you've got something in the $60,000 per quality, that we're not in a space where pretty much all decision makers would be 
comfortable saying that that's a, a cost-effective uh, use of resources um, uh, for in the US context. Um, the 178, that three times the, uh, the, the threshold, that's quite a high figure, although it does fall uh, in the uh, range that uh, Peter Newman and colleagues recommended back in 2014 in their New England Journal. Uh, relatively recently, there was a couple of papers that were, were published, the first by uh, Marseille and colleagues and the second by Bertram and colleagues. Marseille, uh, in reviewing uh, alternative approaches to specifying the cost protection threshold, uh, were really quite uh, critical of WHO's uh, uh, proposals, uh, arguing that they were arbitrary, and I'll go through that in a little bit more detail on the next slide. Uh, and a response to that came from Bertram and colleagues. Uh, and I have to say, I was somewhat unconvinced by Bertram and colleagues' uh, defense of the thresholds, in that it boiled down to, in essence, saying all of the other factors, apart from the cost effectiveness uh, that uh, Marseille and colleagues uh, flag up, should be taken into consideration and are outside of the cost effectiveness. Uh, threshold uh, decision rule. But the threshold is a decision rule. Uh, and it's to, to say that you, you put forward a decision rule, but it wasn't really a decision rule, strikes me as somewhat circular and, and unhelpful. Uh, and I, I think uh, Marseille and Connie's critiques actually stand very well. And, and, and this is a summary of their main criticisms. Essentially, it's arbitrary. That there's no normative justification for the thresholds that they put forward. Um, and to a degree, the, the more detailed critiques that uh, are below that on this slide are, are specific examples of, of uh, the uh, lack of a justification, either from an efficiency or, or an equity perspective. So these thresholds take no account of affordability. They don't ask whether actually the budget of the health system in a particular nation is capable of withstanding the budget impact uh, of a technology. They take no account of local priorities. One can see that in some countries, infectious diseases are going to be a much higher priority than chronic diseases or cancer, uh, whilst in more Western developed countries, we might be uh, prioritizing the diseases of old age uh, due to the needs of our population. There is no uh, place uh, for this, these considerations uh, in, in these really quite hard and fast decision rules that have been put forward by WHO. Um, they don't take account of variations in efficiency of the health system. Uh, I think, you know, we, we know, certainly know ECD countries, there are very large variations in the efficiency of, of, of health systems. Uh, and in uh, uh, less developed nations, I, I'm sure that's equally true. We, we you know, we have, uh, you know, Carl's work on the NHS suggesting that the cost per quality there, the threshold there, might need to be 13,000. Uh, that is, uh, you know, an order of magnitude smaller than uh, the, the sort of figures that uh, people are talking about for the US. Uh, which really is quite remarkable. So even within OECD countries, we've got massive variations in the efficiency, uh, and therefore uh, imposing thresholds that take no account of that uh, seems to be less than helpful. Um, I was always struck by this next point, that the, the WHO took absolutely no account of uh, uh, non-health calls on the available resources. You know, for any particular nation, it may be more important for them to invest in education or infrastructure more than direct healthcare. That, again, this statement that you should be making this portion of your available resources being uh, on call for the healthcare system, for healthcare technologies. It, it normatively, I, I don't see how uh, any organization outside of the nation itself has the right to make that call. Uh, but who felt comfortable doing so? 
Um, almost worse of all is this final point. The three times GDP threshold frequently does not separate out uh, the technologies that are being made available on the market uh, because it's too high. Most, the vast majority of technologies will get below that threshold. So in that case, how does it help decision makers? Uh, so that's, uh, I think those are all uh, very legitimate and robust uh, criticisms of uh, the World Health Organization's proposal uh, for thresholds. Despite that, they are widely cited uh, and undoubtedly influential. Uh, and it probably is a, 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 a coincidence, but they're not a million miles away, or more accurately, Peter Newman's uh, and colleagues' recommendations in the New England Journal are not a million miles away from, this, from that sort of ballpark of, uh, of, of recommendation. So uh, they have been very influential. Uh, whether that influence can be justified beyond essentially an appeal to the authority of the World Health Organization, I very much doubt. And, and I think Marseille's critique it is thoroughly justified. And I, I wouldn't be recommending that uh, I still look to uh, an authority based justification for what they do in this space. Moving on from uh, thresholds, uh, the, the World Health Organization thresholds, is this really lovely paper by Ryan and Svensson in Health Economics in 2015, which reviews the uh, empirical literature on, uh, on the willingness to pay for equality. And uh, I'm going to draw on it very heavily for the remainder of uh, my uh, presentation. Uh, the good news is Relatively, there is quite a bit of literature from the US on, uh, on the willingness to pay for equality. And equally good news is actually the numbers in some of the studies, the sample size of some of these studies are, are non-trivial. Uh, so very encouraging that the quality of the evidence available uh, for the US really could be quite good. Um, it's not quite the end of the good news, but it's one of the last good news bits of the story, I think, unfortunately. Um, here we see uh, uh, table two, which gives us some insight onto the methodological differences. And I think there's two here that are, that are particularly important. Um, one is the societal or individual perspective, and, and I'll come back to that. Uh, towards the end when I, I, I wanted to have a discussion about what is ICE's objective uh, and what does that mean for the, uh, the relevant uh, perspective for obtaining values uh, uh, for qualities that they might want to use. So we have uh, King et al and Shawa, uh, I'll probably pronounce that awfully and I apologize for that, uh, who have both got uh, uh, general health uh, for the US, uh, and one of them is individual, and the second one uh, gives us data on both the uh, individual and societal perspective. Um, so here are the numbers coming out of the US studies, and, and you look down the right-hand column, the, those are the mean estimates, uh, and we're instantly struck by uh, the variation. So I, I just want to Let's focus for the moment on uh, the difference between the Shirawa and the King et al. Uh, so King et al is around just under 21,000 euros, uh, Shirawa et al, uh, 45,000 euros. So that's a very large difference uh, between two estimates from the US, not that far apart. Uh, in the uh, for, for the US, looking at general uh, health, uh, one's the individual, the other uh, is, is societal. So that, that there's a big difference there. I also just point out that that Burn et al. also 2005 uh, did um, estimates which looked at uh, I think osteoporosis, osteoporosis uh, specific. 
and their value is massively lower, 3,163. So you can see that we don't have great stability uh, in, in, in the values that are coming through. Um, just doing a, a quick uh, a currency conversion, you'd get to about 60,000. So very much at the lower end of uh, the estimates, very different from uh, what's in the World Health Organization recommendations, uh, very different from what's in the new Manetal paper. Uh, would have, you know, thinking about uh, Jan's comments yesterday about the impact on innovation, uh, if you were starting to price using these sorts of numbers, uh, then the sorts of reduction in revenue from the US market to companies that, uh, that, that Jens was flagging up as, as challenging, uh, they would be at the generous end of, of what we would expect uh, the effect of applying this sort of uh, threshold to. Um, Ryan and Svensson also looked at uh, estimates from uh, obtained from the value of statistical life. So we've got the value of statistical life at 3 million. What's the attraction of this? The attraction of this is used in other areas of public policy. So coherence around the value of life or the implied value of life from a willingness to pay with other public policy investment assessments. That, that, uh, that, is, that is an appealing idea and there's been a few papers that have, by combining those data with uh, life expectancy and quality of, uh, age specific quality of life data, been able to produce some estimates. Uh, and this is table five from the Ryan and Spencer paper and, and we get the mean estimate over there circled. So uh, 242,000 uh, euros. Uh, quite a widespread standard error of 35,000 there and, and a skew with the median down at 109. So again, we're getting, even within this estimate, a wide range of variation. And if we do that same sort of uh, uh, currency conversion around the 300,000. So we've got 60,000 at one end, 300,000 at the other. We, we're getting huge variation. I think there's, there's some specific challenges around value of a statistical life uh, approaches that, that, that we need to think about. Uh, uh, that it doesn't mean that there's something wrong, but their practical application may become a little challenging. Uh, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, just uh, next slide is just to put up the, the, uh, the formula they've used. And it's just to say, look, these are the inputs. Uh, and these inputs are variable by population, um, and, and therefore we will we would expect to see um, across the uh, population, uh, across the U.S. in different states, different payers. Uh, even if you started with the same uh, value of statistical life, you're going to end up with very different uh, values of willingness to pay for equality. Uh, Perversely, pay is covering the most sickly populations because their life expectancies are uh, shorter, will end up with higher thresholds and that might drive some challenges around affordability. Uh, and pay is covering the health po uh, healthiest populations because they've got much longer life expectancies, um, would have uh, lower thresholds. And frankly, that's, you know, that, that's picking a fight with the inverse care law. How acceptable will it be for, for those healthy populations uh, to, to be facing lower access uh, to, uh, to, to these therapies? Uh, I suspect not very. Uh, they have the ability to take their uh, health insurance business elsewhere. Another issue here is that you know, when, when we go to the value of statistical life, we are locking in very clearly on health. It's a demand for health uh, that, 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 that we're looking at. Thinking about Jens discussions yesterday and, and lots of the policy conversations around what is the, the appropriate value, uh, willingness to pay for healthcare technologies, you know, we generally we're, we're talking about, well, there's innovation. Uh, we, we, we have an interest in 
equality or equity uh, domains uh, in the provision of healthcare. We, we have a, a concern for solidarity with our uh, with our fellow citizens, and and, and I think uh, Patricia Danson mentioned it yesterday. You know, would we be able to identify a minimum level of of, of solidarity? And uh, those are things that I think are a really important part of the the policy debate, and that's are really quite problematic uh, to uh, carry on a vehicle. Uh, where your willingness to pay for health is, is, is uh, obtained through the value of statistical life. Uh, I may be wrong, but you know, I, I, I think it would be uh, problematic there. So, um, comments and questions to uh, hopefully start the conversation uh, uh, for the remainder of uh, uh, this webinar. Uh, first of all, hang on. Very obvious. There's no off-the-shelf estimate uh, of a U.S. willingness to pay for health that, that you could defend as being uh, more robust uh, and uh, generalizable, uh, and even more uh, uh, more granular level. Looking at the literature, there's not even a consistent model of, uh, of of what's being measured. Who's willingness to pay for what? So a lot of the uh, papers that we see are about the individual's willingness to pay for their own health in a specific uh, clinical indication, but not all of them. Uh, some of them may be, you know, are, are about own health, uh, willingness to pay for own health, but it's general health, but then we have uh, societal willingness to pay for others' health. So there's, there's not a, a consistency about what it is that's being valued. Uh, and that brings me to my, my first question for the discussion. Um, what's ICE's objective in adopting a, a willingness to pay uh, cost effectiveness threshold? What is it they're trying to do uh, in, in, in their role? Um, are they trying to identify a threshold that's consistent with uh, financial sustainability of uh, healthcare systems, um, are they wishing to provide a signal to manufacturers about uh, the value of health uh, to guide investment decisions, to guide uh, what the innovative industries do? Uh, are they seeing themselves as an agent of society about the social value of health or are they actually trying to reflect uh, individuals' value of health and willingness to pay for health that would translate into individuals' uh, willingness to pay for different insurance premiums. Uh, I, I'm not sure, but if we don't know what the objective is, uh, then it's hard to say what the appropriate perspective for the willingness to pay question would be. It's hard to say uh, what the uh, components of what was being bought, what you're willing to pay for would be in, in, in a, a well-designed DCE or, or, or conjoint analysis uh, question. Uh, and, and so it'd be interesting to hear from Steve and uh, uh, Rick maybe about what is the objective? What do they think they're doing with this uh, or would be doing with, with, with this willingness to pay value? Uh, if we have clarity about that, then we get to uh, the appropriate population whose values. Uh, and it struck me that in a world, the US, uh, and this is a very US issue, uh, as I understand it, you know, wh when, when Medicare are not allowed to negotiate drug prices, are the values of the Medicare age group relevant? Should they be surveyed? Should they be asked their value of health? Is it relevant or actually should they be excluded? I don't know the answer, but it, it does seem a, a, a legitimate question to ask. Depending on what you're trying to do, and because of the context in which you are operating, who you ask to give you values uh, is, is really important. Um, given your objective, as I say, I'm not completely certain how the value of uh, uh, statistical life approaches. Uh, if it was all about health, then I, I can see it and it works very well. But 
if you have a wider objective function, then you've got to find a way to identify trade-offs between the health and those other approaches. And, and we know that those trade-off models are highly unlikely to be linear. You know, what we know from all the valuing health and the psychology management literature is that the interactions are the norm. Therefore, assuming a linear model to extrapolate uh, is, isn't, isn't likely to succeed. You, you know, we see it in the bolt-on literature where people have tried to add another domain to, to, to the EQ5. It doesn't work because respondents are actually uh, that their latent function has an interaction term with the domains of health and the non-health domains of the decision problem. So uh, I, I think might run into trouble taking a BSL approach in that way. Um, so final question to have there is, uh, so can we uh, extract an implied willingness to pay from revealed preference uh, on the insurance coverage data? Uh, I'm like, maybe I was being too pessimistic uh, with my uh, worries about the, uh, the, the complexity of, uh, of, of the insurance coverage market in the US. Uh, could we, uh, from those, uh, those citizens who chose not to uh, comply with the Obamacare mandate and to, um, to, to, uh, to pay the penalty, can we extract from their choices uh, information around a, a, a maximum willingness to pay uh, for healthcare? Uh, I don't know um, uh, uh, the answers to any of these questions, to be honest, uh, but I, I'm certainly looking forward to hearing smarter people than me discuss them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Uh, th that was great. And I'm, I'm going to completely uh, avoid answering any of your good questions <laughs> at this time. You have to imply what ICER's answer would be some of the questions. We're, we're going to probably come back to that towards the, the tail end of these, these webinars in a sense. But um, these are great questions. And we do have um, three people who we've identified we'd like to hear um, responses from. So David Meltzer, do you mind if we start with you, please? And oh just, sure, and, sure. And introduce I, yourself to the to the crowd, if you will. Great. Um, I'm. Can you hear me? Okay. We yep. sure we sure can. Okay, great. So I'm David Meltzer. I'm a general internist and PhD in economics. Um, here at the University of Chicago. Um, Chris, thanks for your your great comments. And uh, Jens, I also really enjoyed yours yesterday. And I'll try to respond in some sense to both because I think some of the issues come to come together really well. Um, first of all, um. I really appreciated Chris's discussion of the the issue of whether income can serve as a proxy for um, the value of life and willingness to pay, and particular the WHO thresholds. And I, I agree with the the criticisms of those, you know, largely as as arbitrary. I do want to highlight that there is some data to help inform some of these. Um, I think there was a nice review by Kip Viscusi a number of years ago on um, using revealed preference techniques to look at willingness to pay. And they did show there that um, willingness to pay clearly did increase with income, but the effects were small. And, and so um, I think that may be an interesting um, literature to reference in thinking about these issues. I think, though, that this question of whether um, willingness to pay for health varies um, across populations by income is really a proxy for this much deeper issue that Chris referred to, which is this question of heterogeneity and valuation of health. And, and this gets really to the core question of what it is cost effectiveness analysis is trying to do at its most basic level. Is it trying to set a threshold of minimums that are going to be used to determine what coverage is available to people without paying any of their own money? Is it to look at particular populations? I think unless we address that question in a pretty fundamental direct way, it's pretty unclear to me what any of our work you know, really means in the end. So I think that is just a first order problem. The, the second thing that I really wanna highlight is this question around sort of willingness to pay. And I, I wanna draw the distinction that is sort of hidden in what Chris talked about, which is the difference between willingness to pay estimates that are based on, on surveys versus willingness to pay estimates that are based on revealed choices. Um, 
um, both have have strengths and weaknesses. Um, obviously, the the nice thing about a revealed choice is, in many cases, it's a true choice someone made. So it's not just saying what you value, but 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 proving it. The problem, of course, is that as Chris highlighted, there are all sorts of market imperfections and decision failures that make those estimates really problematic. And that is true whether the estimate comes from a decision to buy or not buy healthcare or coverage, or whether the decision being analyzed um, reflects something like taking a fundamental health risk through on um, a, a job-based um, risk of mortality or something, which is where a lot of the value of the statistical life literature um, comes from. And, and that also interacts with this issue of heterogeneity. One of the things people often forget is that the value of a statistical life estimate based on a risky job is based on the person willing to take that risky job, not all the people who chose not to. And so um, it's an underestimate for the average person of what the value of that is. Now, those are some of the critiques of the sort of revealed preference approaches. It should be pointed out that all the survey-based approaches have incredible sensitivity in many, many cases and often poorly examined to how the questions are framed and asked. And that needs to really be considered. And then there, there's a, a last issue related to the survey design and calculation, which is that we move often very fluidly between the value of a statistical life and the value of a life here. And we should remember that that's based on a series of assumptions about discounting and expectations and other things, um, you know, most of which are by no means benign assumptions. Um, I just want to end with sort of highlighting this broader issue, which I think begins to connect to what Jens discussed about, about how the threshold is used in the context of the overall decision-making process. And, um, you know, Jens pointed out nicely that there are times when we really don't need to worry about thresholds um, and um, when um, there's no evidence of benefit, we think about, for example, you know, reference pricing. But there are other instances clearly where we, we start to think about trade-offs between money and, and health benefits. And it's very tempting to think that we want a threshold there to decide whether it's worth it. But I, I will point out that one of the reasons we turned to cost effectiveness analysis as opposed to cost benefit is that no one likes putting a, a, a threshold down, that they're very uncomfortable with it. They recognize it can be heterogeneous. And so in, in a funny way, this question of trying to pin down the threshold should raise this question of why, uh, why we're even doing cost effectiveness as opposed to, for example, cost benefit analysis. And I, I think the answer in the end is that this is uncertain. It's poorly defined. Um, it's sensitive to many assumptions. There's heterogeneity. And I think that's one of the reasons why doing sensitivity analysis to willingness to pay threshold is probably a, a really good idea. And of course, that ties to the questions of both net health benefit and, and also affordability. And so just my, my, my last comment is, you know, we, we think about the threshold as in some sense defined um, based on a budget and available set of resources. Um, it's worth pointing out that one can take a different approach to this, which is to start by saying we want to do the things that are most cost effective and do that until the point where we run out of money. And um, um, so if you do that, you don't really need to know a threshold. You just need to know relative cost effectiveness and um, start spending your money until you run out of it. And um, but that assumes that all decisions are analyzed. Um, of course, they're not. Um, but it does raise this interesting question of whether you could have a more complex process. And I, I think this was touched on in the, the last session a little bit, where, um, for example, you decide to do certain things, even if they don't meet a co clear cost effectiveness threshold. Um, but that then pulls money out of a pool. And then if you don't follow that process that makes something an exception, you're left in a situation where you calculate a cost effectiveness ratio and you just um, use and you have a certain pool out of which you pull things um, until you reach the highest cost effectiveness ratio that you can afford within that pool. If you're not happy with how far you've come in that pool, you either allocate more money to it or you take things out of this exception process and in, thereby um, enlarge your pool. So I wonder whether that might be a sort of intermediate approach that sort of splits this difference between um, the budgetary and threshold approaches. So let me let me stop there. Thank you very much, David. I really appreciate that. Um, good. Um, I'm
probably not going to go back to Chris quite yet. I'll, why don't we go ahead and have Lou uh, comment, and then I'll either hand it further on to Jens or, or over to Chris at this point. Um, so Lou, why don't you go ahead and forge ahead? We have a couple of slides. Okay. Please. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, Steve. We sure can. Yeah, we sure can. Great. Well, first, I want to thank Eister for organizing this webinar series. I think it's a great group of fellows, and uh, it's already had great discussion. And I, and I really want to thank Chris for setting up these issues so nicely for uh, for uh, the, the uh, using the GDP per capita in surveys. Um, what I want to say is, uh, you know, I think willingness to pay is a reasonable approach to thinking about these thresholds and in our system, which is a consumer sovereignty based, uh, what I would call extra welfare system. So, you know, it's obvious we have tremendous heterogeneity of uh, income and preferences. Uh, um, but, but basically, when I say consumer sovereignty based system, I'm talking about maximizing uh, well being of citizens uh, rather than, say, maximizing uh, qualities gained from a fixed budget and a welfare approach. Um, as, as David said, uh, value varies across indiv individuals. There's tremendous heterogeneity. So Jeff Bezos is willing to pay a lot more for uh, an extra year of life than, than I could pay. Um, uh, value could vary across indications. You know, the qualities delivered can vary across medicines. And then over time, value changes as we move from efficacy to e effectiveness and get real world evidence. So it's, a, you know, trying to pin down value of a specific technology is complicated. You know, in theory, we can use the, uh, you know, uh, contingent evaluation, which is uh, a stated preference approach to get at the incremental insurance pre premium. And this, uh, you know, but I think it's impractical. This goes back to um, to the work of Garber and Phelps in 1997, basically saying you can think about this welfare, this utilitarian welfare maximizing situation as an incremental insurance premium. So we could ask a person, well, when you're age 20, what would you be willing to pay? and incremental insurance premiums over the rest of your life in the event you need a heart transplant. Uh, in a country where we're spending over $10,000 per person, that incremental premium over a lifetime is going to be tiny. I would say a yeah, dollar, two dollars. People really can't answer such a, a question about such a small number. So I see the quality as we've used it as basically a, a pragmatic workaround for that. So I can ask you if I know your value, what you're willing to pay for a life here, I can work out, I can do the epidemiology, do the, all the discounting and say, well, if that's what you're willing to pay for life here, then this is what this technology would deliver. I should say, um, yeah, I, want to, I also wanna say uh, the uh, ISPOR Special Task Force uh, completed this report in 2018 and basically came and, and supported ICER and sort of saying we should use the quality as the core measure of value, which is uh, a reasonable starting point by recognizing limitations. And I, and I would like to add in all of this discussion, uh, I think people are not, I'm basically thinking about innovative patented medicines, uh, and I think that's what that's what ICER's remit is. So uh, I think it's uh, the quality and a lot of this uh, cost effectiveness works better there than it does uh, in for other technologies, for example, where they don't have randomized trials. Uh, but I also want to emphasize that medicine, these are unique economic goods in that, uh, you know, a new medicine, we only do 30 or 40 a year, uh, you know, high, high cost of R&D on average but they can benefit 7 billion people on the planet so that the scientific knowledge has public good problems. I've said that I think quality-based modeling works better for, for medicines, but uh, these innovative medicines, but uh, you know, the bulk of spending is for physician and hospital care. And it's much harder to apply that, that metric, even though we all real, realize in principle, we would like to. So um, the, the task force basically said, well, the quality is a good starting point for health gain. You know, it captures length of life and quality of life. Uh, but it, but it's limited in that it gets a mean treatment effects and doesn't really ignores the value reducing uncertainty. Can I do the next slide, please? Thank you. Okay, so the next slide, please. Okay, so the task force in, basically said, okay, we should start with the quality, build on that as much as ICER does, but ICER adds in other benefits and contextual considerations. And we identified another, uh, what we called an augmented cost effectiveness analysis, a number of other potential um, elements of value, and I can't go into all of them, but in, there's insurance value, which is financial risk protection plus uh, protection against uh, you know, health catastrophes in a sense. So, for example, we're all worse off right now because we know that there's nothing really that great for Alzheimer's disease. So if something was invented tomorrow, we would all immediately be better off. Um, but just paying for qualities on delivered product doesn't really account for that. Uh, value of hope has to do uh, with cures. There's been some work on that. A real option value, extending life, you know, you might want to invest in conditions for which there's a good pipeline because you can benefit down the road. Uh, 
But in all of this, severity of disease is a consideration. Uh, it was well known that people in, in populations that people feel differently about moving on the quality scale from the utility scale from 0.2 to 0.3 and 0.7 to 0.8. We also talked about fear of contagion. And then there were a couple of other system level factors, equity. Uh, certainly th that's a big issue. And, and so there's some interesting work recently in the UK on uh, inequality aversion. And scientific spillovers is the idea or externalities is that even failed products uh, essentially give information to competitors. So uh, we're somehow, if we just pay for all the successful products, we're not taking that into account. Now, regarding the GDP per capita and the survey specifically, um, you know, I think we the I, I think that the one to three times per capita GDP was aspirational that the WHO had it was uh, basically arbitrary. I agree with Chris on that. I, I wouldn't start there, uh, but but I would point out that GDP per capita is a you know the these are global public goods. Economists would argue we should have differential pricing across countries, and so GDP per capita is going to be uh, uh, certainly an element in that. Uh, optimal pricing across countries. Uh, in the U.S., in, I'm saying income as a measure of GDP, um, the GDP or, or income, in other words, GDP per capita, but income varies and willingness to pay varies with income. Now, we're going to hear from Chuck uh, Phelps on uh, Friday about his uh, paper, I assume, um, his recent paper in value and health, which basically extends the work he did with Garber and Phelps and, and talks about uh, deriving a threshold, I think, at about uh, two, kind, two times income. So, but obviously we have a population of uh, highly variable income. So how do you add up all that willingness to pay of all those different people with different incomes? Now, um, the thing about the GDP per capita is it's averaging over a population in the US, uh, you know, we have uh, kind of a population of those who can afford to pay and those who can't afford to pay. And there's a, a, a transfer, kind of a willingness to redistribute income uh, to support the Medicaid program, for example. So the question is, and I think Patricia touched in, on this yesterday, in some sense, we don't have a solidarity-based system. What we've said is, uh, you know, we do think everyone has a right to some minimum level of health care, and so we have to decide the threshold for that. And that's kind of the threshold for the Medicaid program, which, again, we haven't really worked that, that out. So we have at least two thresholds for, the, for those who can pay and those who, who need to be subsidized. And we have Mark Pauly in our report and, and some papers arguing in a U.S., uh, in our kind of... Uh, decentralized system, you could imagine health plans uh, saying, well, I run my formulary on a, on a certain uh, cost per quality threshold. Now, personally, I think that's really hard to do and show that and prove that you actually did it, but uh, it could be done. Uh, and I guess I would say with regard to the stated preference for the reasons I talked about earlier, I think it's really hard to, to infer much from that, uh, you know, just because you have insurance and people, the low, the low incremental premium costs. So, you know, let me end just by saying, you know, I, I think that um, basically where we're going to end up is that uh, is that the quality that we're going to have a number of thresholds, a number of thresholds, the threshold per, threshold per quality would vary across conditions as we start to bring in these other elements of value, which which alter things. Uh, we still have the question, and I'm sure we'll get to that in the later seminars of uh, the later webinars on what is this margin between other consumption and health spending and how the opportunity costs and how do we think about that and how that affects the threshold. But, but I would say that when you think about individual conditions, if you start saying, and, and then you start to add in the other things that would effectively lead to a, a different quality threshold in terms of the quality component, which is the main component itself would vary. So thank you, let me stop there. Lou, you just got about two hours lecture into about <laughs> 10 minutes um, two yeah. and two slides. So thank you. And I know you were going quickly. Um, I appreciate it. Lots of material in there. Um, very helpful. Jens. Well, it'll be very brief uh, because this was an excellent presentation. Chris, thanks very much. I think you identified these uh, different perspectives very well. Uh, you, you showed that uh, there are probably more questions than answers. Uh, the question that I'm particularly interested, of course, is the one that you raised that the demand side threshold to um, provide adequate incentives for innovation and how would we address these things in there. Uh, nothing else to add from my side. I think we should give Chris some time to respond. Oh, you just, you got off easy, Jens. That's pretty good. <laughs> All right, Chris, absolutely. A lot of material uh, and up to you how you would like to respond, uh, comment back to um, the comments you heard from David and from Lou. So, uh, David and Lou, thank you very much. I think uh, you did a, a fantastic job, both of you, unpacking uh, the, uh, much more of the details of, of, of the buckets uh, that I identified as, as challenges. 
uh, in, in, in my presentation. I, I'm really interested in, in Lou, the, um, your, your thoughts around the, the augmented value framework and how that, how, how moving forward on that augmented value framework with a threshold, uh, in a threshold model, uh, it would work in practice. I think it's um, very challenging. So um, uh, we, like, just last week, or uh, when we were in Basel from right here, there was a, a conversation about hope. I noticed hope was in the augmented threshold framework. Um, and, and, and hope is, is really problematic as an idea because uh, strictly hope should be, you know, in the absence of any evidence that it's there. You know, hope. so it, it actually is it the extreme of uncertainty where you you have some signal of a possibility, uh, uh, but but you don't have it. it really is just a, a a signal of a possibility. Uh, is that really what hope is? Because if it's not, then I think there's an ethical issue around hope of uh, from a, a clinician who suggests to a patient doing something on the grounds of maintaining hope, in what degree that's respecting their autonomy. So I, I, it, it, that's a specific example of, you know, that of an issue in your augmented framework that I know it's in the, in the policy discussions, but when we get to think about the specifics of how we would incorporate those, uh, the option value, we kind of know how to do that, that, that one works, but a few of those other domains that I see as, as really quite problematic to bring into the uh, into a formal threshold uh, or a framework that's speaking to a threshold-based decision rule. Um, so I, I, I'd be interested in your views on that, Lou, uh, and then uh, also to hear from, uh, from Jens on that, because I think that's a big part of, of, of his concerns about our, our direction. Uh, of travel there. And um, I think I'm probably, David, I think you, you nailed it on the heterogeneity, the, the, the degree of heterogeneity uh, and how uh, does that bring us to such a clash in the, in the US context where uh, because there isn't this solidarity, there isn't this commitment to uh, achieving some sort of equality uh, in access to healthcare uh, across the population, that the, the heterogeneity in value, uh, really, that's the, the source of some of the biggest policy challenges, because of wh when, when the, the winners and the losers become obvious, uh, apparently trying to access the same technology, but because of heterogeneity in values, you get these differential access uh, situations. From a, 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 a real politic uh, perspective, are we? Can we really do this in the US? Is it just fall into the category of too hard because of the uh, preference heterogeneity issues? So those are my two responses. But brilliant. Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, let me respond. Uh, sure. On the uh, on the value of hope. Okay. I mean, first of all, I want to point out that um, Darius Lakdawalla and Chuck Phelps, who are both members of the Esport Task Force, have just released a working paper in the NBR paper series, where they basically do a Taylor series expansion of the utility function to deal with kind of variability of outcomes and argue, you know, to kind of a, come up with terms called risk aversion, temperance, and uh, I'm forgetting the other one now. Uh, but they have several terms, and basically they're showing that because cost effectiveness analysis doesn't take account of that variability, uh, you know, it doesn't sort of capture the value that people get from knowing that there, there's a big fat tail in the distribution, in the survival distribution. Now, we can certainly model that tail and take the present discounted value of the qualities, and we can do that. But what they're sort of saying, there's a psych another psychological effect that people would be willing to give up some current survival for that chance for the cure. And Darius uh, and colleagues have done some, uh, Darius Lackdawall and colleagues have done some empirical research, which sort of shows, you know, shows that kind of an effect. And that's the basic idea. Of the, I mean, value of hope is a nice, sexy term, but it's more specifically like, it's more specific as far as I know to that cure. But I would say on any of these terms, we basically have only three or four or five papers. We don't have that much literature. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been worked out. Uh, you could certainly think of trying to monetize them as an add-on to the quality, you know, the quality gain, whatever you threat, you have, say you have a threshold and then add it on. So 
a net monetary benefit, which becomes more of a cost benefit analysis is certainly a path forward. But I think, uh, you know, there's basically a call for more research. I think people see the logic of that, uh, that value of a, the value of a cure. And that's kind of what they they get at in that paper. And I'm sure you can get Chuck to say more about it on Friday. So thanks. All right, thanks. Gentlemen, we have about five minutes left. So I'm, we're gonna try and manage a few other questions and comments back. So we'll try to keep it <clears throat> brief if we can. So David, uh, did you wanna also respond to what Chris said? And then I've got a question here in the room. No, no, I'm, I'm good. I share it with others. I thought those were great responses. All right. And Carl, try to be quick because I've got a question too. Okay, I'll be real quick. The only way value could be really truly revealed is if we had customers, namely patients at point of care who were fully informed and were not protected by insurance. We don't have that. There's huge asymmetry. There's agents who are imperfect with their own agendas. And thankfully, most people are protected by health insurance, so never have to face the full marginal cost of their choices. So even in a private healthcare system, there is no such thing as an individualized choice. Your choice with your physician to access more expensive care will be in part paid for by you, the copay you're up for in your consumption, but most of that will be paid for by other people. And it will be paid for in two ways. It will be paid for in co reduced consumption for others paying higher premiums and higher copays, and it will be paid for by others who are priced out without access to healthcare or still have a coverage but actually ultimately can't access care because the co-pays are unaffordable. So let's just apply the basic principles of shadow pricing in benefit cost analysis. Identify where the opportunity costs fall and then value them appropriately. And I think if we do that, we can't go far wrong. On the question about, okay, how should we value consumption effects relative to health? I'll be real quick. I totally agree with David. There's another reason why VSL is hopeless for this purpose. Mishan wrote a paper called Wild Goose Chase in 1976. You can get any VSL out of a revealed preference study of whether people are willing to pay to bear risk depending on the level of risk you face them with. The values go from zero to unbounded. And finally, John Broom, I've run out of time, but are coherent decisions around social choices, which this is, even if you set aside equity con considerations, actually, it all turns on who's known and who's unknown. Yeah. Chris, any quick reaction? I don't think there was a question there. <laughs> <laughs> is it not a fact? You're listening, you're listening carefully. You're listening. <laughs> is that right? Do we, do we all agree? All right. Um, I do have a question. Um, sometimes, and you can help me where I'm wrong here probably. So sometimes I, I really do wonder when we talk about willingness to pay, what do we do with the revealed fact that the UK spends 8% of GDP on healthcare in the US, let's say 18%. <clears throat> because then we could think of thresholds as reflecting, even if we wanted to shift from willingness to pay over to opportunity cost, how we make best use of that 18% of GDP. Or do we think that that 18% of GDP is not our willingness to pay for health care? And maybe it should be less than that or more than that, but there's a normative approach. Because I know that in some of the discussions I have with policymakers in the U.S., when I talk about willingness to pay, they focus, Medicaid, for instance, <clears throat> will say, depending on what level you're talking to them, they will say the real problem with Medicaid spending is that it's drawing resources away from education and other things that the state needs to do and that we are somehow our willingness to pay is not being reflected in the spending that we are currently doing on health care and we need to rebalance that somehow so i just wanted to ref just kind of share that conundrum around you know what does it mean does that eight percent versus eighteen percent does that reflect a willingness to pay Think of willingness to pay more broadly is the right way for the U.S. to think about it, how we manage the 18%, or are we already taking too much from other aspects of societal goods? Chris, what's, what's your thought on that? Well, I, I think in the U.K., those, you know, over time we see uh, the portion of GDP varying quite a lot, really, as, as different uh, political parties have power. I, and I think what we, we see is you know corrections uh of uh when people have felt you know the electorate have expressed that maybe it's getting a bit too high 
Um, and, and so there's been a, a downward push uh, on, on that budget over the last uh, eight years. It's not aligned with my values, but that's undoubtedly what's happened. And, and the people who've done it have obtained uh, power, uh, you know, have been re-elected. So, you know, uh, it appears to be socially legitimate. I think it's much harder to, to, to be confident that uh, uh, the 18% uh, spending on uh, Medicare, uh, re whether, whether that reflects uh, a social value, um, because the most electors are, are not actually beneficiaries uh, of, the, uh, of the public spending on, on healthcare. Um, in the US. And so that sort of nice, clear uh, social agent interpretation of, of expenditure being judged through the ballot box um, is much harder. So I, I don't see it, an easy way of, of seeing a signal about appropriateness or inappropriateness in the US system. So I know that's not helpful. Uh, I wish I had something helpful to say. No, that's fine. Thank you. And we, we, we've come to the hour. And again, I know we could continue on. Well, for those of you listening, you've shown your willingness to pay. These are free webinars. <laughs> but you've had to spend an hour of your precious time. I hope it, you feel it's been well spent. I certainly do. We'll look forward to the next one on July 26th, where we will continue talking about willingness to pay, shifting a bit towards perhaps a, a further conversation around past funding decisions via cells. But we'll also have a chance to talk at some length about uh, relative risk aversion, some of the new work that Chuck Phelps um, has been working on. So thank you very much to our main presenter, Chris, and very much also to our respondents, uh, David, Lou, and Jens. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. One hour is too short. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it's <by> fast. <laughs>